It was a lot of work, but we have insanely talented people at Halfbreak. Our biggest kind of challenge was just trying to figure out how to truly make it feel like you are doing this slicing, getting it one for one, making it feel juicy and exciting. We wanted to be able to pick up a fruit off the ground and slice it, throw it somewhere and have you know the juice and the splats appear everywhere. And it was just a lot of iterations and trial and error. As Shaz mentioned before, um, we're a company that's not afraid to fail. So we thankfully had a lot of support and were able to just keep trying things over and over and over again until it felt right. Sifter.com.au Hello, this is Lightmap from Sifter. Our interview show today, we're chatting to the creators of Jetpack Joyride and Fruit Ninja from the Queensland-based Half Brick. CEO Shaz Dio and Super Fruit Ninja product manager Madison Annabelle are my guests and you'll learn more about this Australian studio's history and the new adaptations of their games for the Apple Vision Pro headset. Join the Sifter community on Discord at sifter.com.au forward slash Discord. Chances are, if you've picked up a phone in the last decade, you've played one of Half Brick's games. Fruit Ninja, Jetpack Joyride, maybe Age of Zombies, maybe you're a bit more old school. Played one of their Game Boy Advance or PlayStation or Wii titles. In an industry that surges and wanes, Half Brick has been one of the enduring stories of game development in Australia. Chaz Dio is the CEO and one of the founders, and Manny Annabelle have just put out their new title, Super Fruit Ninja, and Jetpack Joyride 2 for the Apple Vision Pro. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Chaz, I'll start with you, since you were there at the very beginning. Your games, when you first started out, you talked about how it sort of started in, you know, just a basement. You were very kind of inexperienced in the early days and you were kind of just going from there. Tell me about how you got those first opportunities and turned it into something that existed, uh, you know, at least 23 years after you first founded the, the studio. Well, it's a, it's a long period and it wasn't an easy road, but um, I think it was a lot of just patience and perseverance, you know, to build up the credibility to actually get our first break into making games. And I think all up, it probably took about two years from when we started the company. You know, we were scratching around, making demos, shopping them around, getting lots of rejection uh, <laughs> letters. But eventually, we managed to team up with one of the local Brisbane studios and work on a Game Boy Advance version of um, their console games. How did that relationship come about? Is it just because you were running in the same circles? Do you knew people that worked there? How did that kind of all come together? Yeah, well, we were um, we kept our head down and we were just trying to trying to build something that we could show people that we actually had the skills to make a game. But uh, the industry at that time was starting to to grow and there were a lot of meetups. And so we, you know, we got introduced to various developers and the heads of the studios. And, um, and then it was really a case of sort of getting to know them, letting them know what we were doing, and then actually showing our wares. And, um, you know, when we did that, they could actually see that, you know, we knew what we were doing and, and the deals came from that. The Australian industry has kind of had a few big phases and sort of not that long after you sort of started out, there was definitely a big dip. A lot of the studios that were around kind of closed up shop. A lot of those talented people went off and did uh, indie things after that, after their big international outlet disappeared. And I'm just curious about thinking back through your history, you know, you've, you've now been around since 2001. That's quite a long run for any company at all but very long time for a, a game development company. What do you think has been, I guess, the thing that's kept you going, kept you working on what you're doing, uh, you know, after all the things that have happened in the past, what, what's kept you working on games and, and, and continuing to this day? Well, um, I get flashbacks to 2007, 2008. They were, they were quite brutal times. Um, but I think what we managed to do, in the period from when we started to that, you know, to that great, I guess, seismic shift in the industry was to just get through making, you know, lots of different games. So I think in that period of five or six years, we probably made, you know, six or seven games. And we just developed the ability to, to make something really good within tight constraints. So both, you know, timeframes and budgets. And so when those tough times came, I think we were battle hardened and we'd also learned our craft enough so that when any opportunities presented themselves, we could jump onto them. 
And at that particular time, the opportunity that was emerging was digital distribution. You know, so before that, everything was on a, a CD, DVD, ROM, or you know, a cartridge. But we'd um, honed our craft, and we we were making good games, and we knew that if we could just get it to um, the market, we'd find an audience. It's not that simple, though, is it? Just getting it to market and finding your audience. You were, had some particularly good timing. And we did, we did, and finding the audience was tough because. You know, at the beginning when we were working on our own games, which is every developer's dream, you know, we were making games for ourselves and the games were quite difficult to play. So when we first released those initial, you know, indie games that we made, great critical reception, poor commercial success because they were too hard for, for the general audience. So, you know, we, we took our lessons from that and we continued to iterate. We actually put our games in players' hands before you know, before we released them, just so we could tune and balance. And once again, just through that trial and effort, trial and error, iteration, we just got better and better each step. And then, you know, the big I guess break for us was when smartphones took off. You know, with the iPhone, and that opened up a, a massive market. And you know, there's a lot of luck in this as well because we we focused on handhelds, so that meant we worked on Game Boy Advance and then DS. Uh, Nintendo DS, and that was like the first sort of touchscreen devices, and all of that translated well to the iPhone. So when that came out and it and it exploded, like we had the right skill set to make games for that specific device. And so, you know, a lot of luck, a lot of hard work, a lot of pers- perseverance. It's an interesting time. I remember. Um, waiting anxiously for the iPhone to release in Australia. I think it came out about a year. Uh, well, the, we weren't, we didn't get anything until they did the refresh, basically in Australia. And and when the App Store came about a, a year later, if I remember um, correctly, um, that your games were very much early opportunities there, and it wasn't actually the same space in those days. There was probably you know only a few handfuls of games. If you had a phone that could play an app, you'd be like, oh, you've got to try this one app because it's the app to try out. Um, and that sort of feels like such an interesting thing. And I'm curious about like you know I've heard the Apple Vision Pro version of Fruit Ninja being described as one of the killer apps for this new device. And tell me about how you design a game like that and try to get yourself into those positions where you are the killer app on any particular device. Because it seems like you've kind of tried out a few different things, really, anything that kind of comes across. I saw Ouya, I saw Connect, lots of different bits and pieces in your history. Definitely, definitely. And I think from a company standpoint, we are ourselves early adopters. We like to jump onto whatever is coming out next. And even if we're not sure if it'll succeed or not, you know, we dip our toe in the water. We look at the strengths of that hardware and we we cater, you know, towards that. So a lot of our design process is around let's see what the device affords us and let's come up with gameplay mechanics that sort of really lean into that. So if we go back to the iPhone, um, those first games, like Fruit Ninja was one of our first games, and we we looked at what was successful at the time because we we kind of held back for about you know six months or a year before we really jumped into that, and we saw the games that were succeeding were tailored to that device, made the use of touch or the gyros or whatever else. So we have an internal game jam process, and we put constraints. And the constraint for that particular one was make a single screen iPhone game that your mum could play, you know and. Fruit Ninja, as you know, a single screen game, very easy to use, accessible. That came out of that. Maddie, Fruit Ninja has got more than a decade of history, and I'm just curious about bringing it to this new hardware. This is one where it feels like everyone is kind of chucking out the wall to see what they can do with this thing. VR, of course, is not new to your studio. Um, you've done plenty in that space before, but I'm just curious about this new very schmick, very fancy uh, VR headset that's come from from Apple. What did you have to do to make Fruit Ninja and Jetpack Joyride work on those platforms? It was a lot of work, but we have insanely talented people at Halfbreak. Our biggest kind of challenge was just trying to figure out how to truly make it feel like you are doing this slicing, getting it one for one, making it feel juicy and exciting. We wanted to be able to pick up a fruit off the ground and slice it, throw it somewhere and have, you know, the juice and the splats appear everywhere. And it was just a lot of iterations and trial and error. As Shaz mentioned before, um, we're a company that's not afraid to fail. So we thankfully had a lot of support and were able to just keep trying things over and over and over again until it felt right. 
what's the core of Fruit Ninja? If you're designing it for a new platform, you're bringing something over there. What is the key interaction that you want players to to do and want them to love and fall in love with? It's always that slicing, the the type of thing where you could do it in real life, but you'd probably get in a lot of trouble if you were just walking around hacking up bits of fruit. So I, I really think it's just that whole, you know, being able to take something whole, breaking it up, making a mess. What does the a platform like the Apple Vision Pro allow you to do that you haven't been able to do with any other sort of VR headset or, uh, you know, any other augmented reality like the Kinect version that you had on the 360? What does it allow you to do? This one, I think, definitely allows you to be much more hands-on in a way we haven't been able to do before. Um, just having it be your own environment getting all the effects, all the fruit stuff, being able to have truffles, the pig, walk around in your area, jump up on your couch. It's been really fantastic to see how we've been able to use your real world environment and mush it together with the game world. Um, And our our dream is to kind of have it be kind of two things existing together as one and being able to go between the two to truly kind of give people a magical experience there. You are probably one of the few people in Australia who've actually got experience with this headset. It's not available here as we're talking at the moment. Can you tell me a bit about what this potential is for this platform? Apple wants it to be the future of computing. And I'm just curious about from your design perspective and from game development perspective, where you think it sits in the sort of world of VR and AR and all of those sort of things. I think it's genuinely kind of the next step into the future. Um, It's fantastic experience that word sorry it's a fantastic experience and i know we have a lot more we want to do with it i'm not entirely sure how much i'm allowed to say um but i'm excited to see what ourselves as half brick and what other people are able to do with this because i think it's going to open up much like the iphone gaming to a lot of people who may not have previously considered gaming i wasn't convinced initially you know i thought okay this is just another vr device and for the longest time when I was, I was playing the builds, obviously giving feedback to the team, I, that's what I treated it like. But then as the device evolved and we got to see more of the features, it was like, wow, okay, this is the real deal. This is the next sort of leap in terms of computing. And uh, when Apple speak of spatial computing, like that's, that's what I see, like bringing it, bringing it into your own space, being able to convert your space into your virtual computing environment. And whether it's watching a movie, actually doing work, programming, coding, or, you know, playing games all in that one space. So I, yeah, I believe that it is, you know, a a huge leap. It's a generational leap and we're only starting to scratch the surface of what we can do with this device. So I'm, I'm a believer now. I was a skeptic, but I'm a believer now. Do you think it has a space in the workplace? Because this is something that I hear people talk about as well. And I'm wondering, because Chafrika, I understand it is mostly remote. You've got people all around the place working in different bits and pieces. But is that something you could use to connect your team together in a in a virtual space, in a, in a working space? For, sh- for sure. Like from my point of view, um, yeah, we, we've been working remotely for a long time. And, you know, these video conference calls are, are pretty good. They do a great job, but there's so much you miss. And one of the things that, I've been playing with with some of the teams you know, that, I, that I work closely with is using those virtual uh, reality chat tools. And just having that, that depth and that third dimension adds so much more to the experience of you know, just being able to communicate and collaborate with each other. So from my perspective, uh, I think there's yeah, some, some really amazing opportunities there to bring people closer together. You mentioned that you're early adopters, and I'm just curious about what you are looking for when you see a new piece of hardware uh, when you're trying to bring one of your games across. Is there some, is it, as you said, you know, you could have a single screen experience? Is it, you know, a a clicking or a tapping sort of interaction or whatever it is? Like, what is it you see, okay, hey, we could make Jetpack work for this, or we can make Fruit Ninja work for this particular thing. What is the sort of thing that you're looking for in a new piece of hardware that's coming out yeah we have a lot of tech techie people here that love playing with new toys and so that that's one side but i think the other thing is just what is new about this device that opens up i guess new interactions that people haven't experienced that allow us to play around with them and you know explore them deeply to see what what we can do with it so you know, when VR came along, 
um, that was like, okay, that's that's super cool, looks great, but there's nothing that you could do with your hands. Hands weren't in the world. Um, but as soon as that came along, it's like, okay, now is the time. Let's jump in with that. You know, before it's just okay, you put this thing on your head and you're looking around and seeing some images. But now, once your hands are in there, it, you know, we can do something with that. And I think it goes for any sort of device. We look for what is what's what's it going to afford us to do something new that people haven't seen before, and really come up with some compelling new gameplay mechanics that we can build games around. I'm curious about, you, you mentioned you have sort of an internal game jam process when you're designing new ideas and trying out things. And I'm curious because Half Brick is a studio that's known for Fruit Ninja, for Jetpack and all of these sorts of things. You've tried a few different projects along the way, but what does it look like in the balance of trying out new ideas versus making the things you know work and bringing them to new audiences and new hardware? That's a great question. It is a balance. I think we lean more towards innovating and coming up with new things, but we do need to, you know, there are certain certain um, bets that we take that are that are safer, and it's a combination. But, but sometimes <clears throat> we get lots of offers to take our games to new platforms, but sometimes those platforms are not geared towards the, you know, to making it work. So we really try to balance that out. Like we do things on platforms where we think there's a chance. Of bringing the audience something new that's going to be fun and innovative, not just gimmicky, you know, or shallow. So uh, for us, the emphasis is on innovation, but at the same time, we we do um, we we do do some safe bets here and there. What excites you in the future of hardware? The thing that excites me about the future of hardware is how can you make hardware more immersive? How can you get the player into the experience? You know, we really pride ourselves on creating visceral experiences. And the more the hardware, you know, we break that barrier between the hardware and, and, and the human, that's when we can really make things visceral that stand out and leave a lasting impression in people's minds. What about you, Manny? Do you, have you got an ex- something that excites you in the future of a way that we could play games? I am a fiend for anything that makes gaming more accessible. And I think that's why I'm very excited about all the VR and MR and Apple Vision Pro stuff. I just love the fact that anyone can pick it up and as long as you can move your body parts, you can actually play and experience it. You're not locked to just needing a controller and being able to reach everything or using a keypad. It's just anyone can pick something like this up and just be able to play without having any knowledge of it. Half Brick is a studio that's been around, yeah, for since 2001. It's been it had a lot of ups and downs over the times. You've had times when you've grown in size and you've t- had times when te- staff members had to go away. And I'm just curious, as thinking about your history with the company um, and, you know, those people that have been part of the team and have left over the years, you know, how is it to run a studio like this for that time? You know, what are the compromises you need to make in order to keep your company alive? Well, you know, it changes over time. In the early days, it was we were running on the smell of an oily rag, you know. But so things were very tough. We had to make sure that we were very prudent with the decisions that we made. Um, as we grew and we had success, you know, we we um, we expanded quite a bit. And it's hard to maintain the the culture, the tightness of the culture, you know, as you grow. But I think for me, the the key thing is. Uh, we want. Oh, I want to be working with people that are passionate about games. So that's, you know, that's that's a must. And I want to be working with people that, you know, we have fun doing what we what we're doing. And over the years, people have come and gone. But one thing I've noticed at Half Brick is that people who come to Half Brick are, you know, just really great people to work with. And a lot of people say that, you know, compared to other places that they've worked. And so the bonds that we form inside last long after people leave. And people leave and come back again and leave and come back again. So we've sort of built this, I think, really nice relationship and and this shared history over 23 years. What are some of the lessons you've learned along the way leading this studio? The lessons, the key lessons that I've learned are, firstly, you can never compromise on quality. Uh, and that's one thing that we always did, even in the beginning when we were under really tight constraints, we put all of our effort, all of the money that we were getting to make a game into making the best game we could. It had to be a fun experience. And I've realized, well, over the years, I've realized how important that is because once it levels you up in terms of what you can do, like 
the output, but also your reputation. You know, people know, okay, we can go to these guys to get a quality product. I think the other thing is providing people with autonomy and the freedom to create because a lot of companies put a lot of constraints on people and it makes it very hard to explore outside the boundaries. So we try to limit those boundaries as much as possible, but at the same time instill a sense of responsibility and accountability. And I think the last one is you have to think for the long term. You know, you have to plan for the long term, not take shortcuts, you know, persevere when times are tough, you know, when things aren't going to plan. Uh, knowing that, okay, if we if we stick to our principles, we stick to, you know, the, the quality bar that we want to hit and our goal, you know, we'll find a way to, to get there. Have you ever felt a pressure uh, for external groups or maybe people coming, waving checks to make half brick into something you didn't want it to be? That, that is a constant pressure. And when I was younger, you know, I would succumb to that pressure because, Usually what happens is when you start out, there's no no one knocking on your door. There's no opportunities. And then once you find success, the floodgates open. Everyone's knocking on your door and they want a piece of you. So um, in the in during those early days, yeah, I think I succumbed to that pressure. But now I'm I'm very clear on what it is that we want to do as a company. And I also understand, okay, which things are going to be a distraction. And I'm much better at saying no. I think that's another important skill that I learned, the ability to say no. I saw something you put up on the website the other week about uh, speaking of external pressures or maybe dreams for what half brick could be. Someone's t- saying that you could potentially have been involved in Web3. Has there been pressure from those groups to get involved in that? Because that seemed to be quite an interesting thing that uh, a lot of other players in mobile spaces and more casual games have thought about or even dipped their toe into. Uh, Web3 is a hot topic. Uh, the only thing I'll say to that is I'm not a believer <laughs> in Web3. <laughs> and any rumors about us being involved in that space are um, unfounded. Maddie, now that the game is out and people are playing it and you're getting some of the uh, experience and feedback from people uh, who've had it and played it, tell me what that is like gathering all of that and what that feels like um, when people can play your game. Uh, honestly, for the first week, it was pretty nerve wracking just because this was something so new that we kind of, we, we thought people would like it because it's Fruit Ninja you know, it's nostalgic, people love it, everyone remembers it. But because this was such a new platform, we were kind of worried about how it would be seen. And thankfully, people have really been enjoying it. Um, We're getting a lot of good feedback, good and bad, but the bad only makes us improve more. So we're not going to, you know, knock it back or, you know, not take it on board. Um, But I, I got really excited just to start looking at all the Let's Play videos and watching people have fun and We've had a few people who have very excitedly had truffles next to their pets and trying to get them to like interact with each other. And I, I've just really enjoyed seeing people find joy from what we were able to do. I'm interested as well. How do you sell a game like Fruit Ninja again? Because a lot of people have probably played it, maybe maybe on different platforms over there. What do you do to get people to pick it up and try it again? You've got a few balls in your court already, um, but I'm just wondering what, is it, what does it take to, to get people to try out this new version? This time we've fully leaned into the hands-on approach. Like you are the ninja. You've gone back to the old school juice jitsu times where before blades were invented, everyone was using their hands. Um, we've done that. We've added in these cool new superpowers where like the old school ninjas, you also get to do things like a hand seal to activate special powers that'll then let you interact with the fruit in different ways you can't do in other games um and really just the big thing is the mess we've had an amazing artist do some really really good work to just get your area completely covered in juice especially when you get to the pomegranate at the end where you're slicing as quickly as you can and then there's just this big burst and it is the most satisfying thing to experience What's inspiring you in terms of game development? What is the things that you are looking at and going, hang on, this is something that's kind of changed the way? Because we have these moments every year where there's a game that comes out and everyone talks about it. We've had Baldur's Gate come out. Everyone was talking about Elden Ring. I know they're very different games to what you're doing, but I'm sure, you know, that conversation is part of what you talk about when you're talking about the way that we play games. And I'm just curious, what are the inspirational things that you've come across recently that sort of influence your work? Yeah, okay, for me, I think it's 
all things VR. Like I've uh, I've really been immersed in you know VR for the last probably two years. Uh, this is a project that I'm working on, which is a VR project, and it's just amazing what you can do, you know, with with um, that hardware. So, and and I think Maddie touched on it before, just the accessibility, the physicality of VR, and how it sort of takes people out of their usual you know, thinking about what games are and showing them a whole new way of playing. So that's really inspiring me. How about you, Maddie? Similar vein, I think the VR, MR, and just the spatial experiences is something that really get me excited. One of my favorite things to do is watch those videos of grandparents putting on a headset for the first time and then going to a whole new world and just being able to create things and, sorry, being able to bring whole new places into someone's living room and just give them an experience they maybe would never be able to do in the real world. What's going to win? VR or AR? Mixed reality. Which one's going to win? Mixed reality, I think. I'm very excited to see some horror games that may come out of this type of tech. And, you know, you can get that proper feeling of creatures behind you and around you and everything like that. How about you, Shaz? What do you reckon? The jury's out. <laughs> I can't commit one way. Or That's why I put you on the spot. I want you to <laughs> have a crack at what you think. What's your gut feeling? Even if it may not be true, I'm just curious where you think. I, I really think... We're just at scratching the surface of the mixed experiences, and I think there's a lot there that's uh, undiscovered yet. So I think in the long term, that is going to win out. What advice would you give to other developers? In Australia, we've got a really good independent development scene. There's studios that are now getting really big opportunities internationally. We punch above our weight, I think, definitely on the international scale. But I'm curious about the advice you would give to small teams uh, who have started out and are maybe getting a bit of attention for the hard work that they put in so far. Don't get uh, caught up in the hype, <laughs> especially when things take off. Keep your feet on the ground. Keep doing what you're doing that got you to that point because, yeah, a lot of temptations come along, you know, when you find some success. Uh, so, yeah, just stick to your vision, stick to your goals and keep working hard. What about you, Maddie? What advice would you give to teams working on their, their games uh, in Australia? Yeah, I'd say stick to your guns um, within constraints of the thing you're working on. Don't be afraid to try things you might not think is a good idea because it might turn out to be the best and most funnest thing in your whole game. It's just something you never thought about. Um, Big fan of trying, failing, doing better next time in kind of all aspects of game dev. So yeah, I'd say try everything. You never know what might be fun. What comes next for Halfbrick? What are you working on next? Can you tell us anything about the projects we might see from you very soon? Yeah, um, for me, we're doing a lot. Actually, there's so much going on at the studio, but I'm an old school gamer. And one of the things that I you know, look back on with nostalgia is playing games with my friends you know, around the couch. And so one of the things that we're doing is looking to bring back those sorts of experiences to mobile you know, through our, uh, our, our new service called Heartbreak Plus. So multiplayer experiences that are easy to jump into, and you can just play with your friends and li- relive those old school memories. Tell me a little bit more about how that all works. So, um, so uh, Half Brick Plus is our new subscription service uh, that we're launching. And so we've got a collection of our old classic games that are available as part of that. And we're making new games as well. And we're really leaning into multiplayer and user-generated content uh, just you know, to provide those experiences to a mobile audience that may not get to experience them. So basically, you know, we're looking to revive some of those uh, four-player multiplayer co-op or cooperative experiences and just make it super simple, you know, to organize parties, jump into a game, jump out of a game, into another game, have some fun for a while, and then go back to doing your own thing. How much of a departure is that from the way that you've released games in the past? Because I know a subscription sort of library sort of system is pr- pretty popular, both in TV and film, but also with things like Game Pass. And I'm just curious about what inspired that decision to move into sort of a subscription, jump in and out sort of experience. I think a number of things have led to that evolution. But to me, it's, you know, we've been around for 23 years and we've seen many new models come and go, you know, from paid games on discs to digital distribution to -to free-to-play to subscription, which I believe is going to be the next sort of wave. and for us, it's just a logical sort of extension of what we're doing. Like we are really good at making premium experiences rather than free-to-play experiences. So I think 
the subscription model is the model that um, I see most potential in sort of moving forward to create those premium experiences. And, and that's why we're sort of going down that path. Well, it's an exciting time and, and hopefully in 10 years time, 20 years time, we, we can have another chat and see what has changed in the time uh, since then. Shaz and Maddie, thank you so much for joining me on Lightmap, sharing a little bit of the history of Halfbreak and your new games on the Apple Vision Pro. Can't wait to see what next bit of hardware comes out and we can look for the next version of your games. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sifter is produced by Fiona Bartholomeus, Daniel Ang, Adam Christou, Courtney Borat. Mitch Lowe is our senior producer who's edited this episode. And my name is Gianni DiGiovanni, and I'm the executive producer. You can find links to everything we've talked about, including some videos on our website, which is sifter.com.au. And of course, if you want more conversations uh, with game developers from all around the world, but lots from Australia where we're based, you can head to uh, the Lightmap feed on, on YouTube, or you can head into your favorite podcast player and check through our back catalog. Until next time, have fun. <laughs>